Hello, everybody. Happy Tuesday. Welcome back to Fire and Pass from Home. It's the free family history series. Just for you, we do a lot of things over on Farmer Pass from Home. We do Fridays Live on Friday, where we talk through new records that Farmer Pass has added this uh, in, in that particular week. And sometimes we do fancy midweek sessions. And I'm not alone for this one. Uh, I'm delighted to welcome back Jessamy Carlson of the National Archives. Hi, Jessamy. Hi, Ellie. How are you? I'm OK, thank you. It's quite warm here in Edinburgh today, which is very unusual for Edinburgh, but I, I am have... basking in it. I have heard that Edinburgh and Glasgow are the warmest places in the country today. I mean, it's usually like the other way around. Yeah, I'm quite happy with that. Um, yes, um, my, if you're new here, my name is Ellie. Uh, I'm Senior Community Executive at Farmer Past and I like doing things like this with the community uh, whenever I get chance, basically. And the reason I've got Jessamy here with me today is because um, a few months ago we were chatting and we were talking about tackling some of your brick walls but not just trying to find you a solid answer but talk through what we did and why we did what we did so we hosted the first brick wall busting session last month and you guys said you wanted it to be a regular thing so Jessamy and I are hopefully going to do this probably once a month where we can when it fits into our busy work schedule. <laughs> Um, Jessamy, just in case anybody isn't familiar with you, would you mind just uh, reintroducing yourself? Of course. Um, so I'm Jessamy. Um, I'm the Family and Local History Engagement Lead at the National Archives here in Kew. Um, and I've been doing research, family history research, since I was 10. Um, so, yeah, lots and lots of experience in researching um, other people's grannies. Um, and I like uh, saying I really enjoy not only like trying to, to break down um, people's brick walls, but kind of talking through how I've gone about it. Um, and I know from conversations I've had with, with readers here and, and, and people in other spaces that um, sometimes just explaining in quite a lot of detail why and how we've gone about something is actually as useful as the end answer, because there isn't always an answer, but sometimes at least the, the methods we've used have ruled out a load of things. And actually across the examples we've got today, I don't think we've got definitive answers for all of them, but we can at least rule some things out, which gives you a slightly more focused route to keep pursuing, hopefully. Exactly. It's about, it's it's more about the, the how rather than the what, because I remember you saying to me a few months ago that, Genealogy TV programs are great, but typically they just show you the end result. They don't show you how they got there. So this is this is really what we want to focus on. And it means that even if we don't look at your brick wall, you can still take some of the the, the methods that we've used and hopefully apply them to your own research. Because you might think, oh, do you know what? I've not tried that. I could try and do that. Yeah. So. Yeah, even if we've not done your brick wall, it will hopefully be useful for you. And there were loads. There were like 200 responses. So we are slowly <laughs> working our way through. And some of them some of them are trickier answers to others. So it's quite difficult if you're working with really recent stuff. I think there's a really fine line you need to tra tread in genealogy between when you're kind of getting too close to Monday. And I know some people are really keen to get in touch with like every possible cousin going. Um, but it's not always appropriate at least for us in this position to be doing that kind of stuff and some of the parts of the world you're asking us about aren't necessarily our areas of expertise but we're trying to get through as many of them as we can so hopefully we'll have some interesting conversation for you guys this afternoon absolutely so this is busting your brick walls round two so before we get cracking let's just uh, welcome some of you in the comments because there's plenty of you here lots of familiar names i can see we've got kim joining us hello Janet from my native North Wales, say hello to it for me. Um, Andrea from a cloudy Stoke on Trent. Oh yes, we've got Rose in the comments with us, but um, we've only got Rose for the first half an hour um, because Rose is a busy little bee like the rest of us. Um, we've got Karen joining us from a cloudy Enfield in North London. Uh, Christine from a Los Angeles, Ooh. California. Let's go there. Um, Ellen says it's 26 degrees oh. at 10 a.m. in Roscoe, Illinois. Too warm. That is quite warm. warm. That's probably a little bit over my preferred temperature. Um, 
<laughs> got Adele coming to us from Cheshire. I know Cheshire very well. So many of you here. This is lovely. We've got Kath joining us from a warm Merseyside. Uh, Sheila from Ireland. Oh, there's oh, so there's many of you. What a spread. This is fantastic. OK, what we'll do is we'll get cracking because we have a lot to get through and I'm worried that we won't have enough time. So, um, Jessamy, you are first up. Over to you. So the first one I looked at was um, Katie's Alfred Watson. So um, her great grandfather, he married Margaret Louisa Reed and saying his brick wall was with his parents um, and that his birth year changes quite a lot. Um, and that that's quite common in this period. Um, lots of people don't have ready access to their birth certificate. Um, and if you are the youngest of, say, 12 kids, um, you can probably understand that your mum might not be completely on top of exactly when you were born by the year. Um, so changing dates is quite a common thing in this period. It's really frequent even now for people to be out by a year on their death certificate. Um, so it, it's probably more common than you think. Um, so let's start with the 1939 register, um, which lists Alfred's date of birth as the 20th of December, 1866. And you can see it says retired pensioner in big red letters. And then on the side, it says 4283 Gordons and then 2482 8L. Um, and subsequent records have shown that that L stands for Lancashire. And then it says officer servant. So essentially he's been someone's bag man during his military service. Um, so having found him in the 1939, the next obvious place to start is the 1921 census. Um, and we can see Alfred living in two rooms with his wife, Margaret, who's 16 years younger than he is, their five-year-old son, Alfred, and their baby daughter, Mary Margaret, who's a year and eight months. And he's working in the dry docks in Manchester by this point. Um, so we know from his 39 register entry that he's got military service behind him. Um, I thought this was probably First World War, um, given the time period we're looking at and the age years. And, and I was right about that. But actually, he's got quite a lot of prior experience. Um, so if we look at his army service record, this is really cool because burnt records only survive for about 20 to 25 percent of the First World War soldiers um, who served. So to get a really detailed form like this, or you can see it's slightly tatty around the edges, um, but his army service record shows that he attested in 1892 and he served all over the world. He was in the Boer campaign in the beginning of the turn of the century. He was in India and latterly he was in the East Indies. Um, he was actually invalided out in the July of 1910 with debility. Um, and if you look at this, um, at the, at the screen, you see at the bottom, it says details of, of next of kin. And it lists his father as Alfred Watson of 6 Hope Street. So I did have a look through. I can't find an Alfred Watson living at 6 Hope Street in Leeds. And I did read three different um, registration districts worth of censuses to see if I could find him. And I couldn't. So I don't know whether somehow the wrong name has been transcribed for his father but i can't find an alfred watson in leeds in say the 1891 census um which is just before he signed up so i'd expect them to tally i can't find a single alfred watson with a date of birth before 1850 in the 1891 census so there's something weird going on there that i can't quite put my fingers on but there just isn't anyone living it. And, and Six Hope Street is there. Um, there's a guy called George Riley living in it, but that's not Alfred Watson. So, yeah, putting that one to that side. Um, so the next thing I checked was the um, the birth records to see how many um, Alfred Watsons there were born in Leeds. So I gave it a relatively brief, well, relatively broad span. So I looked for... Alfred's born in Leeds between 1860 and 1870. And there are only actually three. Um, one is an Alfred Myers Watson born in the December quarter of 1863. Uh, there's another Alfred Watson born in the December quarter of 1867. And a third and final Alfred Watson born in the December quarter of 1870. Um, so I had a look through the various censuses 
um, the Alfred Myers Watson goes on to be an iron founder um, and then marries um, a girl called Christina in the late 1880s. And by 1891, um, he's um, living in the census with his wife. And you can see at the bottom of this um, attestation form, it says unmarried. Um, you can see the bit at the bottom is blank. Um, and if he had a wife, it would have been recorded. Um, so he doesn't appear to. So I think we can rule Alfred Myers Watson out. Um, he's the son of James Watson and Mary Myers. And I, I'm just not convinced it's him. There's too little in common between the life that that Alfred Watson leads and what we're seeing in this service record, which I think is quite a key document. Um, and then the 1871, I thought might have legs. Um, and he's the son of Henry Watson and Emma Cavender. Um, and by 1891, he is still living with his parents. He's still in Leeds and he's listing himself as a locksmith. And he rocks up quite consistently as this locksmith. He marries a Sarah Anne in 1893. And there's no mention of this in the service paperwork. Um, which leaves the December 1867 Alfred, which is plausible, except the father's name doesn't map to the service record. Um, and this one uh, is the son of William William Averson Watson um, and uh, Mary Holt. Um, and I think it would be worth ordering the marriage certificate, if possible, with Katie, if you're, if you're listening, to see if there is anything more in this marriage certificate that gives you any clues um, about them. But if it is him, then he is the ninth child of William and Mary. Let me just ping to my notes. So they had one, two, two daughters and seven sons, including a set of twins over 17 years. Um, and Alfred, if he is there, if this is the right guy, is the baby of the family. Um, he's four years younger than his older brother, Henry. Um, and then there were another seven siblings before him, although there were twins in 1852 um, who don't appear to have made it out of infancy, sadly. Um, but I think it would be worth exploring a bit more about this Alfred Watson. Because um, I say, although the father's name doesn't fit, there's enough about the rest of him that does kind of work. I mean, the, it's close enough in terms of date range. Um, and I can't find that Alfred Watson after 1891. Um, so I do wonder if he's in the military and that's why he's not showing up on the census, which would certainly be one explanation, certainly for the 1901. Um, so yeah, I think that Alfred would be worth having a bit more of an explore about and seeing if you can rule him in or rule him out. Um, but yeah, so that's where I got to on him. Great. Yes, lots of uh, lots of food for thought there. As you can see on screen here, you've got uh, Jessamy's provided the two 1871 census records for the two different um, Alfred Watsons. Yeah. Um, so on the left, you've got the ones with um, the parents, William and Mary. And then on the right hand side, you've got Henry and Emma. And I think I do have one more slide. Yeah, I think this I was think. the... Um, uh, well, that was them in 51. That was, yeah, that was earlier them earlier. And then I think we've got the the birth entries, haven't we? Oh, yeah, so the Watson. So William and Mary Ann seem to have been a bit lackadaisical about baptising their kids, and they seem to appear in blocks. So I don't know if there was a new curate or a super enthusiastic vicar in that lot, but they seem to have uh, baptised three of their kids in, in one go, um, including Eph Ephraim. Ephraim? Um, one of their boys, um, quite an unusual name. Um, so yeah, I thought that was that was quite interesting. And then I think the latter image was the birth records with the the three Alfreds. Oh, she's frozen. Looking oh, for she's in or out. Um, so you know, give it a relative. So 1866 is nicely in the middle of a decade. So by looking kind of five years either side, um, I would suggest that's a bare minimum when you're kind of trying to pin someone down is is kind of framing the search in that way and just seeing who it turns up because you know Alfred Watson is quite a common name but actually there's only three really who are contenders because of the place and approximate date that they're born. I think Ephraim is a Jewish name correct me if I'm wrong. Testament, yeah yeah, yeah and here we go. so this is the example so I think it probably is 
I would guess, based on the information we get, I would be I would be wanting to rule this one out or rule him in. Um, that would be where my money would lie. Grand. So, Katie, if you're listening, you've got you've got some work to do. <laughs> right. Shall we move on to our next one? Um, yeah. So I tackled this one, and this is Anne's brick wall for a John Price. Uh, trying to find a birth or a death record or even siblings for John Price, born 1854 in Bermondsey, which uh, is shown in service records. Um, he married Ellen Dennis at some point between 1881 and 1891. They moved to Strood and had children Vera and Gertrude. And then by the time anything about them pops up again, Ellen is living as a widow. So between those two census years, he's he's married, had children and died, which is quite frustrating. Um, and she's also included his service number, which is really, really handy. So like with uh, all of your brick walls, I always like to go back to what you've already found and just to have a look at it myself. I did indeed find a marriage between a John Price and an Ellen Dennis in Devon in 1883. Now, when their child Vera Mabel was baptised in 1886, John's occupation is actually listed as a labourer by this point. And I do get their residence at the time, which is Wickham Street in Stroud. And is it Stroud or Stroud? I think Stroud's Gloucester. Yeah, Stroud's Gloucester. It's Stroud. Yeah. I confuse them. Um, and then you've got in 1891, just to, so everybody can see, you do find the widowed Ellen Price. She's a laundress living at 21 Gunner Street in Portsea. And she's got two children here. She's got um, a child, Gertrude, and then you've also got the infant, Percy. Now, he was born in Portsmouth um, in 1890, I think. And um, I just want to jump ahead as well to 1911, just to see if there's any clues here. So we've got her um, at 10 Cottage Path, and you've got... Um, Oh, no, I'm looking at the wrong one here. Hold on. I've clearly skipped one. 19, 1901, excuse me, you've got Gertrude, Vera Mabel, and then Percy. And then 10 years later in 1911, which is the one you see here, it's um, Ellen at 10 Wilton Terrace with Vera Mabel. I did definitely want to check the 1911 census because this is uh, known as the fertility census because for women it would say how long they've been married how many children that they've had, how many children that have survived, and how many children that have died. And it says here, although it's frustratingly crossed out, I can just about read it, it says that she's been married for 28 years, has three children, and all of them are living. So that was that's quite handy. Common, that was quite a common confusion, widows putting information in and then it being crossed out by the enumerator. But super helpful. If I'd been trying Mary. to find a, um, a marriage year for them, um this would have really helped and in fact i use this little quirk of the 1911 census quite often because it's i find it really handy mm. um and then by the time of the 1921 census um ellen is living in landport with her son percy his wife esther and they've also got a son called percy and by this point percy is a serving soldier in the sixth hampshire defense force now i found it really interesting that the son Percy was born in 1890 and I know that by 1891 the 31st 31st of March 1891 which is the date of the census um John Price was supposed to have died so I thought let's go and have a look at Percy's details Percy's baptism perhaps so this is his baptism record and he was born on uh, the 25th of August 1890 he was baptized on August the 8th and his parents are listed as John and Ellen Price. John is a labourer. You've got their, their address here at the time as well. There is nothing to suggest here that John has died. So I am assuming that he is still alive by this point. However, I would recommend ordering his, Percy's birth certificate um, just, to, just to correspond that because if he has, I, I think if he had died, it would likely be on the birth certificate rather than the baptism mm -hmm. record. So it would Although be Although sometimes you get a super judgy priest who likes to fill you in on all the uh, in-betweens of his parishioners. So sometimes you might get a note saying, father deceased. 
Absolutely. So if this is correct, we know that on the 8th of October, John Price is still alive, but by the 31st of March, he must have died. So there's actually only a six month window in which, in theory, he could have died. Now, I wanted to jump ahead again just to see if, again, there are any more clues. This is the marriage record of Percy in 1913. Um, he's a seaman aboard the HMS Britannia, and it gives his father, John Price, a soldier. And, yeah, it doesn't say deceased either, which That's is unusual. frustrating. Yes, normally it would say deceased, wouldn't it? And he's he can't have gone from a soldier to a labourer and back to a soldier. That just sounds bizarre. Mm. So there we go. Then I was, based on the information you'd found um, with his service history, I found this service record that does give the um, the service number of 2193, it gives me his regiment, which is the 2nd Battalion, 23rd Re Re Regiment of Foot, which is the Royal Welsh Fusiliers. And it tells me that their headquarters is in Chatham, in Surrey, and it also gives me the year of 1871. So that's a little bit more to go on, which is handy. Now, there's one guy who matches this description in the 1871 census, and this does say that the guy was, uh, John Price, was born in Bermondsey. And this is this is actually in Chatham, this service record. So it's this service record, this census. So it does match what we saw in the service record. Um, and then that same guy is also in the 1881 census in Plymouth. So we've got a little bit there to go on. And I went and had a look to see if there are any John Prices born around 1851 in Bermondsey in the 1861 census. And there are, there are two. So there's a John Arthur Price born in 1856, but he's living in West Bromwich in Staffordshire. I don't know if that's a bit of a jump. Um, and then the second one is a John W. Price born in 1847 in Bermondsey and he's the son of William and Catherine we've got some siblings there we've got Frederick and Catherine um, and the family are living in, living in Exeter in Devon which is probably a little bit more plausible for me his father this particular guy's father is was born in Wales and it might indicate why John served in the Royal Welsh Fusiliers I don't know um and I can't find the John W Price in the 1871 census. So either he's died by that point or he is your John Price. Anne. So hopefully that is something for you to go on. I know it's not conclusive. Um, I would definitely go back to the, the military records that you found for him because I didn't find any that mentioned his wife or his children. I would be wanting to find those just to make sure I have the right John Price's service records. So I would go back to those if I were you just to clarify, because um, we wouldn't want you looking at the wrong, go, going down the wrong ho uh, rabbit hole, so to speak. Um, so, yeah, that's what I looked at. Thank you very much for submitting that. Okay, yeah, John we... Price is a tricky one as a name, isn't it? Because there's so oh, many. Oh, super tricky. Okay, uh, next one, we're going to do Clara Webb. Now, we did Clara Webb last time, but, Jessica, you found some more, haven't you? I have. Um, so, yeah, as Eddie said, we looked at her last time. So, 39, we've got her living at the National Register at 2 Lawrence Street. And we will note here that her daughter has Webb and Gillett on her. So, clearly a clue that there's some double naming going on here, um, which is interesting. Um, and then if we look at the 1921... Um, Clara is listed as married to Thomas, um, which she absolutely is not, um, with their four kids. But interestingly, Thomas's father is there as well, which suggests to me a certain degree of family acceptance of the relationship. Um, I can find no evidence that they married. Um, but yeah, so by in 1911, um, Clara is listed um, 
Uh, hang on, we'll come back to this one if we make it. We just jump forward, Ellie. Yeah, um, So Clara is listed as a servant in 1911. Um, and if we now hop back, Thomas, on the other hand, is living with his wife and son. So if we could just pop back to the previous screen, there we go. So I wonder if this might be why Thomas and Clara aren't technically married, um, because plausibly, Thomas's first wife is very much still alive and kicking. Um, this is sometimes referred to as a working class divorce. Um, and I wonder if this is what is going on, that the marriage between Ellen and Thomas, for whatever reason, hasn't worked out. Um, and so Thomas, at least, has moved on um, and made his life with Clara. But for various reasons, doubtless financial for some of them, um, they haven't been able to divorce and therefore remarry. Um, I noticed that on the 1911, Clara, as you noticed, um, Carrie, lists Staffordshire as her place of birth. But that's quite a big place. Um, and no one consistently seems to agree on where in Staffordshire she's from, just that she's from Staffordshire, um, which makes me think maybe they're not asking her. Um, in this scenario, she, the census is being filled in by someone else about her. She's not filling it in herself. Um, what I did also find, however, is a Clara Webb in the 1901 census, who is a 19-year-old housemaid in the Hartley Lees household in Crumpsall. Um, and although this gives a Lancashire place of birth, I wonder if this might be our girl, still in service, right age, um, but it also therefore offers us, if we think this might be a reasonable assumption, this is the same girl, um, it offers us a place of high town in Lancashire. Might be worth pursuing that to see if there are any Lancashire births that work. Um, Clara and Thomas had four children. Uh, Mary Ann in 1912. I think Rosalie, the writing's horrendous on the on the burnt records. I think it says Rosalie. It's Rose something in 1913. William in 1914. And James in 1916. Um so I did have a look. So I'm just wondering why all the lights are fading around me. That's interesting. Um, I did have a look to see whether there were any Clara um, Webbs born in Staffordshire around the right age. Um, and I checked between 1880 and 1885. There are only three Clara Webbs born in Staffordshire in that time period. And they're all in 1881. Um, so there's a Clara Webb born in Congleton in the March, whose birth is registered in the March quarter of 1881. Um, there's a Clara Webb born whose birth is registered in the June quarter of um, 1881 in Dudley. Um, and there is a birth registered for a Clara Webb in Walsall in December of 1881. Based on when she says her point, her birthday is in the 1939, that would suggest to me it's more likely to be the Dudley birth, but not guaranteed. Um, I also found that there is a Clarissa Webb whose baptism is recorded in 1882. Um, this is, yeah, this is her, a, a Clarissa Mabel. I'm including this not because I'm absolutely convinced it is her, but because actually I hadn't considered that Clara might be short for something. Um, and it was only when I ran a search for C L A R asterisk A rather than just Clara that it came up with Clarissa. Um, so I think it'd be worth trying to rule this one out. I mean, I think this Manchester baptism might be closer to the bit of Lancashire that's listed in the 1901. Um, I say I'm not saying it's definitely her, but I, I think there's some options there that would be worth ruling in or out in terms of pushing this back a bit. Um, I will keep looking to see if I can find you in the 1891 and push it back a bit further. Um, but yeah, I thought this was a, an interesting one. So hopefully that's that's helped in getting you back a little bit further um, with Clara. Yes, and this isn't the only one we've tackled together, is it? It's not. <laughs> no, we'll come to that later. More coming, more coming towards the end. Um, yes, I'm, I'm very, very pleased that you managed to find <laughs> some further possible answers for this very, very mysterious yeah. Clara. Yeah, I think this and Alfred are quite interesting because both of me think, oh, those are really common names. There'll be loads of them. And actually, with the data we've got, there's, there's not actually that that many. So, yeah, I think there's definitely some potential for exploring 
each of those and seeing what you find. Absolutely. Okay, um, I've got a little one here. This was from Michelle, um, who has a problem with a John William Holland born at Wong Collier's Road, but can't find that census. I don't know who I don't know who his parents' names. Now, I didn't have a lot to go on here, Michelle. So if you do have any other detail you can su supply me with, I would be uh, really, really grateful. Um, of course, my notes are out of order. That's really helpful, isn't it? Um, is this was a bit tricky when I don't know what town or year he was born. Um, but my first port of call with this was something that's you know I've got a, I've got a full name and I have an address. Okay, that's 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 quite that's quite good as a starting point. So what I did, I went into the all census search on Family Pass and I added in John William Holland and I put in Collier's Road into the keyword field. I didn't put it in the address field. I put it in the keyword field. And I got a possible one for you. So there's a John William Holland born in 1869. Um, he was born at Wong Collier Street in London. And um, in 1911, he was living with his uh, in Deptford with his wife. I can't speak today. I'm so sorry. His wife, Alice, and his children. And John is a metal labourer. Now, what was particularly interesting about this census is that he has recorded the exact address of everybody living in this household about of where they were born. So for himself, he's got one, Coll one Collier Street in London, for example. Um, for one of his uh, daughters, I think it says something like one Clare Hall Place or Clare Hill Place. I can't read it. It's too, too, uh, too small. Um, but that was really handy. So this was the only solid match I found with the information you'd provided me with, Michelle. And then I was able to take it back another census year to 1901. And you find the same family and it gives uh, John's birthplace as Islington in 1871 this time. And in addition to his wife and children, there's also an illegitimate son called William G. Ashby, born in 1893. Interesting. So this is, yeah, I thought so. So this is either... Um, it's their son born out of wedlock or it's her son born to a different father. Um, I've seen this happen in my own family tree and I've not been able to confirm whether it is my two times great grandfather's son or whether it's um, a, a, a son by a different father. Um, my, only my, DNA would be. Yeah, to I mean, my that. instinct would be that if the surname remains different, that's probably the wife's son. And that he's yeah. been adopted into the family that essentially you've got a blended family here um i think it's more common where the couple have stayed together married and gone on to have more children for the for that child to then take on the family name um but it doesn't always happen that way so as you say without dna you'll, you'll never know yeah um, but if you have any more information, Michelle, that you can share with us, uh, please feel free to maybe fire it over by, by a private message to us at Farmer Pass by Facebook, um, and we can have another look and then maybe tackle this again in the next in next month's session. Um, so yes, um, Jesse, I'm going to pass back over to you for James Clater. Indeed, James Clater. Mary Ann Kinman in Hull, it's a lovely marriage certificate, this one, suggesting that he was born in around 1855 and his father Francis, which is, uh, Francis, that's the feminine spelling of it. Um, so the Francis that we're most looking for is with an I, not an E. Um, but yeah, you're right, his um, place of birth does keep changing. Hold that thought, because um, I've got a theory about this place of birth. Um, but yeah, so um so yes i think we've got the marriage certificate marriage entry first which is nice and clear so this is the top one and the thing that caught my eye is that his father's profession is listed as what looks like veterinary we don't really have veterinary in the way we think of it now in this period obviously we had people who looked after animals in a in a generically medical fashion but it's quite an unusual profession to see listed so i was kind of intrigued by that um so i think we've got 1921 first is that right yeah so here we are 1921 um they're together in skull coats which is actually where they seem to spend all of their lives together um which is yorkshire i think skull coats North yorkshire. Yeah. apologies if i'm doing horrible geography 
Um, but nonetheless, they stay in in Skullcoats for almost all of their lives. So in 1911, they're in Skullcoats together. It's beautifully filled out. Very neat. Um, and again, in 1901, they're still in um, in uh, in Skullcoats. Um, with a variety of children, including an eldest son who is called Francis, um, which sort of fits with having a father who is called Francis. Um, it's quite common to name your eldest son after your father or after your wife's father. Like there's a, it's quite like patronymics is quite common in this period. Um, so I think that's worth noting. It's why I think it's interesting that that's his father's name as well. Um, if we just hop back to the 1881 census, yep. um, you'll notice that it says James Clayter, head of household, age 26, oil miller. don't know what one of those is. And then it says Repford. And I think it says Lincolnshire. There isn't a Repford um, in Lincolnshire, but there is one in Nottinghamshire. And I just wonder, because if you look for Clayter's, born at all in the 1850s there is a francis clater born in 1855 in repford which made me wonder if this is our man or whether um it's his brother but either way there is an absolute cluster of claters in repford in east repford in lincolnshire um and there is a francis clater um living there um who has five children with his wife Bridget. They marry in Doncaster in 1848 and they have um, Francis who dies as baby, then Anne, then another Francis, then John and then little Agnes who is very much the afterthought. Um, and I just wonder if this Francis Clater, it would be worth ruling him out as our James because there aren't many Claters knocking around at all. It's a really unusual surname. And I think it would be worth ordering the birth certificate of this Francis just to see if James is his middle name. Because quite often you'll have a son who is named for his father and then everyone calls him by their middle name, even though on paper he's Francis. It's possible, plausible, that he's um, he's down as as James to the family, um, and that as an educated man of official work, um, you know, that he might go, you know, what's his name? Well, I'll give you the name that's on his birth certificate rather than the name we actually call him. Um, I also noticed that this Francis is a druggist and chemist. It's not the same thing as a vet. I do get that. But there's just still science about, though, right? It's science isn't it? And I just wonder if there, there's something going on there. But I think this Clayter connection in... East Retford is worth pursuing. It's such an unusual name. Um, I, ju I just wonder. Um, and this, um, yeah, this Francis was baptised in St. Michael, of, an St. Michael um, the Archangel in East Retford in 1856. Um, so, yeah, I would, I would be inclined to pursue that East Retford line. I think that might be where your, your answers lie. And actually, if it turns out they're not, then at least you've ruled it out. But I would be wanting to to look into those quite carefully and, and to see, I'd say, order that birth certificate for the Francis Clayton born in 1855. Um, it was uh, East Retford is the registration district and it's volume 7B, page 18. That should allow you, if you're watching, um, to uh, order the certificate and see what you can find and explore those claters. Did find some mistranscriptions, sometimes for Slater um, and sometimes Claster comes up as well. So also worth keeping an open mind around spellings, which we've talked about before. Yeah, I imagine you could get Clayton with a, sorry, Clayton with a Y. You could get Clayton. Yeah, yeah I've seen that too. Yeah, that's uh, entirely possible. Um but yeah, I just think there's something in the the Redford Redford thing, yeah. and also I don't. I mean, it's not the same occupation, chemist, druggist, going to, going into veterinary, but it's not it's not a, a million miles away. Like you, you, it's still a, a it's still a profession where you would have to know 
quite a, quite a lot about um, yeah. what's the word I'm looking for? You'd, you'd have to know Science. a lot about. You'd have to be scientifically literate, wouldn't you? Yeah, exactly. I struggled to. And that's if, you, if you've ever read the Harriet books, there's quite a lot because veterinary only became um, sort of professionalised um, after the the turn of the the 20th century. Um, when the RVC was set up, but you talk, you read James Herriot books, and he talks about there being, put, you know, plenty of very competent vets with no qualifications. Um, so it's definitely a recognised thing within that profession. But yeah, fantastic, lots for you to think about there. Um, so the last one we've got slides for, because um, as you can tell, I was scrambling to finish these slides um, at like ten minutes to the hour. Um, is for Isabella Murray, and um, this was Denise's brick wall, and this is one that Jessie and I have sort of tackled together. So I mm. started, told you I was struggling, and then you decided to take it and find it some more. My interest, Ellie. This was a really intriguing one, a very sad one, actually, yeah. in fact. So um, Isabella Murray was apparently married to uh, James Stanley Robertson. They were living in Newcastle. And the only evidence Denise has found for that is on her grandfather's birth certificate. He was Francis William Robertson, born on the 3rd of October 1908. Um, and she's been told by somebody that in the 1911 census... Um, the uh, Isabella's not with her husband. Her husband, he was with his daughter, and then the three boys were in chil a children's home, and they were never together as a family again. And apparently, the brother Robert was killed in a car accident on Scotswood Road as a child. So this was a lot to go on, mm. and and yet it was still really tricky. I think it was still really tricky, but um, we think we have some details for you. Yeah. Um, so, first of all, I wanted to try and establish the, the facts that you had, Denise, or the facts that you'd been told. And um, Francis William Robertson was indeed born in 1908, and his mother's maiden name was Murray. And my first port of call was um, trying to hunt down a marriage, because I know you put that they were married, but maybe weren't married. And like you, I struggled However, the thing the thing I would point out is that if Murray is listed as her maiden name on Francis's birth certificate and birth record, that might be her maiden name, but might not have been her surname at the point of her marriage. Mm. She this may have been a second marriage for her, so don't rule that out. Yeah. Um. Then that being said, we, we still didn't manage to find, yeah. I don't think, yeah. anyone. Of course not. But... Of course not. Um, that would be easy. Um, and then 1911, I did indeed find James Stanley Robertson and his daughter Isabella Grace. They were boarding in the household of an Eleanor Irving in 1911. And he was listed as a an ordnance machine man born in Edinburgh in 1868. So you actually have Scottish roots, if you didn't know already, Denise. How exciting. And Isabella is their only surviving daughter, isn't she, of the of the group of children? Um, Other had... than Francis, yeah. Francis is a son, I think, isn't he? Yeah, Francis is Denise's grandfather. Yeah, but um, there was an older daughter, Margaret, who lived between 1898 and 1900 and the younger sister Catherine who was born who was born and then died subsequently in 1907 so Isabella is the only surviving daughter of the Robertson children there are other boys but we'll come on to those yeah and again 1911 fertility census coming to my rescue a little bit here so typically this was only really filled out for women. However, it's been filled out for James in this instance, which is great. So it actually tells me that they've been married for 14 years, if indeed they did get married. Um, this would be, I don't know, he's not filled this out himself, but you could use this as evidence to suggest that they were actually married. Mm. So if this is correct, the marriage took place around 1897. Mm. And it says that they've had, well, he's had eight children, four have died. And at the time of the 1911 census, four were living, which does match with what we have found. Yeah. 
So there's, oh, the other thing to suggest as well is we were talking about this, weren't we, Jessamy? Is with names like Robertson and Murray, they're both very Scottish. Yeah. So it's possible Um, there's a marriage somewhere in Scotland that we just haven't pinned down yet. Um, Of the four children who are listed who have died, so the four, I mentioned the two girls, Margaret and Catherine. Interesting, Margaret's middle name is Harvey. And it's quite a Scottish practice to give middle names relating to surnames of previous family members. So it might be that Harvey is a maiden name of another ancestor somewhere along the way. Um, But they also lost two little boys. Um, They had a a little boy called James who was born in 1901 and died in 1903. And a little boy called John who was born and died in 1900. So their surviving children at this point are George, Isabella, Robert and Francis. So Francis is the the great grandfather of um, for this inquiry. And then Isabella is the one you see in this sense. But you did find the other boys, didn't you, Ellie? I did. Yes. And it was really intriguing that um, Denise, whoever you've spoken to, they were they were absolutely bang on. Um, So this is William. Um, now he is at, well, I think, I think this is, your, I think this is your grandfather, Francis William, but he's just been noted as William because everything else matches. So he's born in 1908 and he's at the Newcastle workhouse in 1911. I think this could be him, but it's worth you double checking Denise to see if everything matches up for you. Yeah. And then I also found uh, Robert, Robert Murray Robertson, and then George Robertson at the St. Vincent's Boys Home on Brunel Terrace in Newcastle. So that matches up with what you've been told. It would be so worth getting in, it would be worth getting in touch with Tyne and Weir Archives to see what institutional records they hold for both the workhouse and for this children's home to see if they have material which they might well. It's a really good little archive, Tyne and Weir. Um, so well worth getting in touch with them because if they don't have it they'll probably know who does yeah the other thing I just want to go back to the uh, 1911 census oh no I've gone too far Um, going back to this one for James it says that he's married and again he didn't fill this out somebody filled it out for him but if this is correct Isabella Murray is alive at the time of the 1911 census but I can't find her. Yeah. Um, so, so frustrating. Um, and then there was one more part of your query that I wanted to touch on, Denise. Oh, this was the list of the children, by the way, for, for anybody's reference. Um, you mentioned that uh, Robert was killed as a child on the Scotswood Road. It was actually not Robert. It was James Murray Robertson. So I found a newspaper article from 1910 that matches what you said almost exactly bar the name of the child who was killed. Um, And it gives the address of 496 Scotswood Road. And there was an inquiry and the verdict of accidental death um, uh, was returned in the end. And the opinion was that drivers should take great care in driving along the Scotswood Road. Um, Very sad indeed. He was nine years old when he died. Um, so I have a working theory before I pass back to Jessamy is I wonder, given that James Murray died in 1910 and then the 1911 census took place less than a year later, I think, or around a year later, with the family all split up, whether James's death, and particularly because she's had other children that have died, maybe took a bit of a toll on Isabella and either she was rendered unable to care for her children or by this point um she had died i'm not entirely certain um it could be a reason for why the family split up but i'm i'm not i'm not definitely not 100 percent sure on that and i have seen this before where parents have been separated through illness um or hospital prolonged hospital treatment where the daughters have been kept with the family but the boys are sent into institutional care because the boys are somehow perceived as more resilient, like better able to cope than the girls. Like the girls need a father to protect them. 
but the boys can kind of get, even though they're quite little, can potentially get by themselves. I've definitely seen this in other families in London, for example. Um, so, yeah, so we, we did keep looking, see what we could find. Um, have you got the 1921 there, Ellie? I have, yeah, there we go. So for a while, I thought I might have found them in the shape of this other family, also called uh, James and Isabel. Um, Robertson, also in Newcastle, also working around the same kind of employment, same kind of place. There's just at least two couples. Um, and actually, this was the thing that really ruled it out for me. And that was the fact that James lists his middle name so clearly as Coltart. Like, this is clearly not James Stanley. So this is not our man. Um, they had four daughters, I think. Um, but we can rule this one out, if that makes sense. I think it's as important to show you that we don't um, that we have to rule things in and out as well, um, that we don't we don't always find the easy route. But um, we know for definite that it is not this this set of Isabel and James Robertson. Um, so could we have next slide, please, Ellie? Of course. There you go. Um, this was the thing I thought was really interesting. So this is the 1921 and you will see Isabella Grace Robertson is listed here as the adopted daughter in this household. Adoption isn't formalised in the UK until 1926. So this is a full five years earlier. I'm interested that she has been formally removed from her parents in the capacity. Um, I don't know whether that arrangement has come between the parents and this woman or whether there's been an intermediary in some form of state welfare organisation. I, I can't tell that. Um, just from looking at this, but I do think it's interesting that Isabella is is so distinctly part of this family. Now, um, I wonder if that means that either one or both of her parents are dead by now. Um, I didn't manage to track down the boys in the 21, um, but clearly this family has been irre irrevocably broken up to some degree. So the information that you've had about how this family were never again together fits with what we're finding in the 1921 essentially um so yes that's where we we've got to i think on on this one um i did find an isabella murray of about the right age in the 1939 but there's just not enough information in it she's listed as a widow but just not enough information in it to be sure that she's any of the isabellas we might be looking for um but this was quite an interesting one to to try and piece through but as ellie says a really sad story yeah. And actually, because we've got a little bit of time left, um, Jessamy, do you mind if I touch on one more that follows no, a similar it. sort of line? Go now, as I said, I haven't got slides for this one because unfortunately I ran out of time. Um, but yesterday, while most people were enjoying a lovely sunny bank holiday, I was working because I live in Scotland and I don't get bank holidays off. And we had a message through on the Find My Past Facebook page from a lovely lady called Debbie. And Debbie was struggling to find her uh, father and his siblings on the 1921 census. So I reached out and I said, right, let's see if we can try and find them together. Um, and with her permission, she says I could share how I found them here today, just in case it's useful for anybody. So the relevant detail here was really key. So her father was James William Cosgrove. He was born in 1916 in India. His father was Joseph Thomas, and he was in the British Hussars, and he died, I think, in India. And then the mother was Susan Ellen Richards. After the husband died, Susan Ellen returned to England with her husband's, um, after her husband's death with her children, and then she died in December 1918 in Kent. And their children, other than James William, were Alec, Pamela and Eileen. And Eileen, Debbie has spelt with an A, not an E. And she said they were reportedly sent to Catholic orphanages. So I decided to search for Eileen first because of the slightly more unusual spelling. And so with just searching 1921 census, I switched name variants on for first name and surname. And I found her at the convent and orphanage in Croydon, along with a sister called Kathleen. And Debbie did indeed confirm that there was another sister named Kathleen. Um, Kathleen was 10 and Eileen was eight. And checking the originals was key here because it did say that they were both born in India. Winner, sorted. Then I decided to see if I could find um, James, so James William. 
So again, I was using the name variants here because Cosgrove can could be could be mistranscribed as something like Cosgrave, for example. And I did find him at a convent school in Littlehampton in Sussex. And it was really intriguing here because it didn't put down where he was born, but it did put down his nationality, and his nationality was put down as Irish. So I checked this was Debbie, and Debbie first. De I, I was I wasn't sure whether I had had the right guy, and. Um, Debbie said, no, I think the family were Irish. That's what he was, uh, my father was told as a child that he came from, from an Irish family. So I thought, like, okay, this is cool. We'll keep hold of this. There was also an Alex Cosgrove rather than Alec, but younger in, um, in this particular 1921 record. So I'm not sure whether this was the right Alec or not. So that was quite good, yeah. We found we found them in the in the 1921 census, so I was quite pleased with that. That was good. Um, but of course, I had to go a little bit further because Debbie said she was also struggling um, to confirm where her grandfather was really from. We've talked about the Irish link, and I decided to go and have a look in the 1911 census to see if I could find him. Now, in theory, the family should have been over in India. And with a little bit of clever searching and adding the county as overseas military, adding India as a keyword, I came across because I was having to, again, with Cosgrove could be Cosgrave example. So I was just searching for, I was just searching with four names at this point and completely leaving off the surname. Um, I actually found um, a family of Cosgraths. Um, the handwriting is very unusual that you could see it as almost like Cosgrass or Cosgraf. It's very bizarre. Um, so you've got James Joseph Cosgrave born, Cos Cosgrove, excuse me, born in 1884 in County Waterford. And he was actually stationed out in India with his regiment and he was there with his wife. She was listed as Susan here, not Ellen, um, but she did go by both names. And then you've got the children, Alexander, it, I think that is Alex, so he could, could could have gone by both names, Kathleen and also Annie Victoria. Uh, she was born in 1906 and Annie was actually in the same orphanage as her sisters in 1921. Interesting. Yeah. Not really. Oh, I haven't finished. Um, <laughs> I really, I really wanted to find out a little bit more about Annie. Um, I'm not sure if I've sent this over to Debbie yet. Debbie, if you're listening, I need to send this over to you. Um, Annie Victoria died in Buenos Aires in Argentina. Wow. And there's two different versions of her death, death record. So you've got her as Annie Victoria Cosgrove, but also as Anna Victoria Maria Cosgrove de Teeb, I think. She travelled to the US in 1931. She married a chap called Francisco de Landa in Westminster in 1935. Then she married Edmund de Teeb in London in 1945. 35. She first married in 35, then she married in 45. And she actually left for Buenos Aires in 1957. Wow. Good effort. There we go. Thank you, actually. A little bit. <laughs> a little bit. So yes, that's uh that's my and Jessamy's effort for your brick walls for this month, everybody. We hope you enjoyed our um trip down the rabbit hole. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks so much, Ellie. Yeah, um hopefully we'll get another one booked in for June. Um I am away at the end of June, so we might have to push it back to July. Um there are a few people dropping comments about other brick walls they've got. If you want to go back and add them to the original thread from March, we can try and um, add them into our list that we're working through. Um, and I absolutely agree with Karen's suggestion that we should give prizes to the neatest written documents because, yeah, good paleography makes us happy. It really does. Like It's so much easier when something's very neat written it's like coming across um i don't know if any of you have seen um jrr tolkien's um 1921 census record where he practiced first in pencil rubbed it out wrote it in a beautiful um i think it's like an uppercase script and then he made a mistake and he had to cross it out and i can almost imagine him sitting there going i just practiced this and i've just made a mistake in ink grr yeah definitely i can picture it so, yeah, we'll try and get another one, but one of these booked in 
for next month. Um, for Friday, Rose is hosting Friday's live this week, so be sure to come back in for that. Jess, me anything, any closing remarks, any words of yeah, wisdom? All good. Thank you for having yeah. me as ever, and look forward to next time. Yeah, it's been really lovely. Um, please, everybody, do thank Jessamy um, for spending her time looking at your brick walls. And, and um, Ellie, too, because she's done just as much work as me. Yes. Yes. But Jess, Jessamy's a very, very, very busy person. You know, you have to. We're very, very grateful. Thank you very much. And thank you so much, everybody, for joining us. I hope you enjoy the rest of your week and we will catch you next time. Take care of yourselves. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Bye.